All right, in this video, we are going to continue on in chapter three and talk a little bit more about determinants. Uh, in the previous video, we learned what a term was, how to find it using um, the first row. And we also talked about how to use any row in any column, which we call cofactor expansion. In this video, we're going to move into a little bit more of an idea about properties of determinants. And we're going to continue on the last problem we saw in the section 3.1 video, where if you can get a matrix into upper echelon, or sorry, upper triangular form, which we also called echelon form, it's really easy to find the determinant. The question becomes, what if your matrix is not in that form, but you want to put it there? How does that impact how you find the determinant? Well, here is the idea. Obviously, we can get any matrix into echelon form by doing one of the three row operations that we've been doing since the very beginning of this class. So as you do each row operation, that is going to impact the determinant of your matrix. All right. So here's how this works. Let's assume that A is a square matrix. All right. And for all intensive purposes, A is the original matrix. All right. These three operations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change a matrix, I'm change matrix A into a matrix B by doing one of the three row operations and we see what happens. The first thing is best case scenario. If a multiple of one row is added to another row to produce a matrix B, then the determinant of A and the determinant of B are exactly the same. This is the replacement strategy that we use majority of the time. So as long as you only use the replacement strategy, you are not changing the determinant of your matrix. Where you've got to be careful is when you use one of the other two row operations. So part B, if two rows are interchanged to create a new matrix B, then the determinant of B will equal the negative determinant of A. And so this is obviously the interchanging condition of row operations. And finally, if one row of A is multiplied by K to produce a new matrix B, then the determinant of your new matrix B is equal to K times the determinant of A. This is the scaling property of row operations. So the only time that your determinant will change in your new matrix of a echelon form is when you either do an interchange step or you do a scaling step in this case. Now do note the equations in those last two. When you interchange two rows, the negative in your equation goes on the determinant of A. All right. And then if you do a scaling technique, the number that you multiply by, whatever that K value is, goes on the determinant of A. The reason that is important is because in the end, the question I'm going to be asking you all in the next few problems is to find the determinant of A. So after you put all of these operations or credentials on the determinant of A, you will have to algebraically then solve for the determinant of A in order to get your final answer. This will make a little bit more sense when I get to the first problem, but I just want to make sure you're aware. You're impacting the determinant of A, which is the original matrix. So here's our first example. It says compute the determinant of A by row reduction to echelon form. So I know that we could use cofactor expansion and you can do that to check your answer if you want, but let's practice this row operation idea. All right, so to put this in echelon form, it looks like my first pivot position, which is one, is already a good number. So I'm going to take row two and I'm going to add two row ones and I'm going to take row three and just add row one. So that will leave the first row the same. Your second row will become negative two, sorry, negative two plus two, which is zero. That's going to be 8 plus negative 8, which is 0, and negative 9 plus 4 is negative 5. And then if I take row 3 and add the row on top, you'll get 0, 3, 2. 
All right. The only other thing you have to do here to get this into echelon form is we are going to interchange row two and row three. That will give you one negative four two, zero three two, and zero zero negative five, which is an upper triangular matrix also known as echelon form. So what I like to do is after I get it into echelon form, I like to kind of work step by step to see how my equation is going to be done. Now, keep in mind this final matrix that you just found. So the upper triangular, that's going to be equal to B in the process here. Now, notice in the problem, it's asking for the determinant of A. So the relation that I like to build is let's set up the relation between the determinant of A and the determinant of B, all right? So on the first step, I'll put a star above the first two. All we did was the replacement strategy twice. And remember the replacement strategy does not affect the determinant, so nothing happens here. On step two, I interchange two rows. Well, as we talked about when earlier, when you interchange two rows, you have to put a negative on the side of the determinant of A. Now, that's all we've done. Determinant of B, you can find from the upper, the upper triangular matrix. Remember, all you're doing is you are going to multiply the three numbers down the main diagonal, and that will be your determinant. So we end up with the negative determinant of A is equal to 1 times 3 times negative 5, which says the negative determinant of A is equal to negative 15. Now, obviously, in the original problem, it's asking for the determinant of A. So just divide both sides by that negative you picked up. So the determinant of A is actually going to equal 15. And that's how you find the determinant of a square matrix by doing echelon form with the row operation strategies. All right. Let's do another one. Let's move to a four by four to show you it doesn't matter as long as it's a square matrix. So we have this four by four matrix A, and I want to see if we can put it in echelon form and then find the determinant of the original matrix. So if I would like to put this into echelon form, there's two things I see you could do. Um, we really want a one in the upper left hand position if possible. So we could interchange row one and row four. Or what I notice is that row one can actually just be scaled by a half because everything is divisible by two. So I'm going to go that route instead. I'm going to take row two, okay, row one, and I'm going to multiply everything in row one by a half. That will give me one, negative four, three, four, and then I'll leave everything else the same. All right, I want to get rid of the three numbers below that first pivot position. So I need to take row two and subtract three row ones. I need to take row three and add three row ones. And then I'm going to take row four and subtract row one. So row one is the only thing being left unscathed here. So for row two, if I subtract three times the number above it, that would be three minus three is zero. Uh, negative nine plus 12 is three. Five minus nine is negative four. And then 10 minus 12 is negative two. For row three, I'm going to add three times the row at the top. So you should get zero, negative 12. Uh, that's one plus nine, which is 10 and then negative two plus 12, which is also 10. And then finally in row four, if I just subtract the number on the top, you're gonna get zero, zero, negative three, and then six minus four is two. All right, so far so good. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to get rid of the negative 12 in the second column. Well, since negative, since negative three is a multiple, I'm sorry, if since negative 12 is a multiple of three, I think we can do this pretty easily without having to change anything. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to take row three and I'm going to add four row twos because I know that negative 12 plus 12 will give me the zero. 
So when I do that, it leaves row one and row two alone. Row three, if I add four times the row above it, you should get zero, zero. That's going to be 10 minus 16, which is negative six. And then you're going to have 10 minus eight, which is oops, two. And then you're going to have zero, zero, negative three, two. The last thing I have to do to get this into echelon form is to get rid of the negative three at the bottom of the third column. So I can do that by taking row four. And I am going to subtract half of row three. So thinking that out loud, that means I'm taking negative three. If I multiply negative six by a negative one half, that's plus three. So that does go to zero. So we're good. So the top three rows remain the same. The bottom row would be zero, zero, zero. And then you're going to have two minus half of two, which is one. And there is your echelon form, which in the end, we're going to call this matrix B for all intensive purposes. We're going to be using the three numbers down the, I'm sorry, the four numbers times the main diagonal to, in order to find its determinant. But let's go back and set up our equation. So if I set up the expression, the determinant of A equals the determinant of B. Well, if you look on step number one, we took half of row one. So we scaled row one to make this work, which means when you scale a row, you have to scale by the same number on the side of determinant of A. And then the good news is that all three of these steps, this step and this step are all just replacement strategies and thus don't impact the determinant any further. So it's just that one half we had to deal with. So what we'll do here is we're going to have one half times the determinant of A and the determinant of B is just the multiplication of the four numbers here. So one times three times negative six times one, which is one half the determinant of A equals, if you multiply all those together, you should get negative 18. Last thing you have to do is to get the determinant of A by itself. So multiply both sides by two, and you will see that the determinant of the original matrix A in this case is negative 36. And so there is a second example of doing relation to find the determinant of a matrix. All right. Now, now that we know multiple ways to find determinants here, a new theorem that kind of brings back the invertible matrix theorem. So if you recall, if a square matrix A is invertible, all of those statements back in the invertible matrix theorem were true statements. If it wasn't invertible, then everything was false. We can actually add a new statement. We're not going to formally call it IMT part three, but I am going to kind of add on to it here. And the following theorem says a square matrix A will be invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. So kind of piggybacking off the IMT theorem we've done in a few sections in the past, we're going to find the determinant of a matrix. If you get zero, that means the original matrix is not invertible. If you find any other value, then the in matrix is invertible. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do here is I've created a four by four matrix and I want to you to find the determinant and all we care is whether the following matrix is invertible. Now it officially doesn't say how to do this. You could either do this by row reduction or you could do this by the cofactor expansion. Since this section is all about the um, echelon form, that's the way I'm going to do this. But keep in mind, it really doesn't matter in this case. All right. Um, let me actually look at it to make sure. Yeah, we'll just do row reduction. Neither way is going to be much fun. They're about the same amount of work, it looks like, but we'll see how this goes. So what I would like to do here is we're going to work on getting this into echelon form. So I'm going to work on column one. So to get rid of that negative six in row three, I am going to add two row ones. 
and in row four, to get rid of the negative five, I'm going to add five thirds of row one because five thirds times three would be five and adding those together gives me zero. Now that last row is going to give you some pretty ugly numbers, but we'll deal with that when we have to. All right. So row one remains the same. Row two remains the same. Row three, I'm going to add two times the row at the top, which will give me zero. Seven minus two is five. Oh, let's see. Negative seven plus four is three. Oh, no, negative three. And then four minus 10 is negative six. And then you have the bottom row, which we are going to add five thirds of row one should give you zero. And then a little scratch work over here. We're going to have negative eight plus five thirds times negative one. So that's negative eight minus five thirds, which is negative 24 thirds minus five thirds. That'll be negative 29 thirds. Then you're gonna have zero plus five thirds times two. That's just 10 thirds. That one's a little nicer. And then you're gonna have nine plus five thirds times negative five for the last column. So that would be nine minus 25 thirds, which is gonna end up being 27 thirds minus 25 thirds, which is two thirds. All right. What I notice here is that row two and row three are identical at this point. All right. So we've learned that if two rows are identical, the most bottom one is going to go to zero. And then what I want to do is we also want to put that row on the very bottom. So after the multiple idea, so keep in mind, these two rows, this row is going to all zeros. I'm going to move it to the bottom after that. So I am essentially interchanging row three and row four. So three, negative one, two, negative five. Then we're going to have zero, five, negative three, negative six, zero, negative 29 thirds, 10 thirds, two thirds, and then a row of all zeros. Now, what you will notice here is that there's really no point in, in keep going. You can if you want to for the practice, but what I know is going to end up happening is since as we change these rows, since this row is all zeros, all right, and technically the only thing I have done here is the, the first two replacement strategies, those have not impacted my determinant. This interchanging strategy, I didn't have to do that, but I did. All that's doing is saying that if I let this final matrix be B, and I think about that equation, determinant A equals determinant B. If I put a negative on this side, all right, so that's where we're at this point. Since the row four of matrix B is all zeros, at this point, if I were to do cofactor expansion, at any point, you can stop the idea of replacement, I'm sorry, of row operations, and you can do cofactor expansion as long as you take into account the replacement and the row operations you've done to that point. Since the row is all zeros, if I cleverly use the fourth row as my cofactor expansion, I can guarantee that the determinant of B is going to go to zero. So if that's the case, if I go back over here to my determinant equation, I have that the negative determinant of A must be zero. And even with that negative that we picked up, dividing both sides by a negative one is not gonna change your answer. So we have just found that the determinant of A is zero. Now, all that to be done, the original question doesn't say what is the determinant? It says use the determinant to figure out whether the matrix is invertible. And since our determinant of A is zero, the final answer to your problem is no. It is not an invertible matrix. All right. One last little critical thinking question I want to do is Sometimes to save you some effort on your test, I'm not going to make you go through this uh, process of doing all the row operations yourself. That being said, um, I do this because 
if you mess up one of the row operations, it's going to throw off your final determinant. And I'm more testing, are you understanding the properties that we covered in the first few minutes of this video? So here's another way I can ask you this question on your assignments. Let's suppose that we have a five by five matrix. And what I've done is instead of actually letting you do the work, I've shown you the process that went in to getting this final matrix. So I started with a matrix A, I transformed it into a matrix A1, and then a matrix A2, and then finally into the matrix A3 that you see before you. Using this idea, can you find the final answer of your determinant? So instead of calling this final matrix B, the only difference is we're calling it the matrix A3. So similarly, I'm gonna set up my determinant equation like I've done so far, and I wanna find the relationship between the determinant of A and the determinant of A sub three. So go through your row operations that I've shown you here. First row operation, I told you that I took row two and subtracted three row ones. The replacement strategy does not impact the determinant, so we skip over that one. Step two, I told you that I took row three and I multiplied it by one fifth. Scaling a row does impact your final determinant, so that one fifth, remember, it goes on the side of the determinant of A. So I fixed that. And then I couldn't find my little fancy arrow button on my PowerPoint. I don't think it even exists. That's I think I made the, made the notation up. But that being said, this last little operation, this is interchange. That's the best I could do on my PowerPoint presentation. But anyways, if you interchange two rows, remember that means you have to put a negative on the side of the determinant of A. Since, determ since A3 is an upper triangular matrix, remember to find its determinant, you're just gonna multiply the numbers down the main diagonal. So we will get negative one fifth times the determinant of A is equal to one times negative two times three times negative one times one. This would give me the negative one fifth times the determinant of A is going to equal and just number crunch this. What is that? Negative six, positive six. And then last but not least, to get determinant of A. Oops, sorry, my scrolled up by accident. If you multiply both sides by the negative five, so that the determinant of A is by itself, negative six times negative five will give you an answer of negative thirty. So. Not by not even knowing the original matrix A, since I provided you the operations that were done, the determinant of the original matrix must be negative 30. All right, and while I don't have any more problems to work, what I wanna end this video with is just a couple of properties um, that might be useful down the line, not saying you're gonna use them all in one problem or even in the next video or two, but these may help you as we go through the next few sections um, where determinants may be useful in different applications. So let's run through these three to wrap this video up. So if A is an N by N matrix, so essentially it's a square matrix, finding the determinant of A transpose is equivalent to finding the determinant of A. So a common myth is, well, let me transpose this to make life easier. In the end, it's not really going to matter because you're going to find the exact same answer. So go with whichever one you think is better for you. The second property says if you have two matrices, A and B, that are both square matrices, then you have an option. If you would like to find the determinant of A times B, you could either multiply A and B together and then find their determinant by itself or if you don't wanna go through the hassle of multiplying matrix A and B together, you can find the determinant of matrix A, the determinant of matrix B separately and multiply those values. The order doesn't matter. It really just depends on what you feel like doing first. And finally, once again, if A is a square invertible matrix, that's the key, we're adding that word invertible back in, then we can say that the determinant of an invertible matrix is equivalent to one divided by the determinant of the original matrix. So you have options. 
if finding the matrix A is straightforward enough, you can just find its determinant and do one divided by that. I really like this property because it avoids me having to go through the algorithm of finding an inverse before finding a determinant. If I can verify that it's invertible quickly, or if I know it's invertible by the instructions, it's gonna be a lot easier for us to find the determinant of the original matrix and then just do its reciprocal and do one divided by that. So this ends the video on section 3.2, which is titled Properties of Determinants. In the next video, we have one more section in chapter three to cover. I'm gonna show you a very small application of how determinants can help us solve systems of linear system, uh, equations. Remember, the whole purpose of this class, back to the first video, we're trying to solve linear systems of linear equations, and we're learning new strategies to do that so that we can continue on in this journey of a class.